Hey, guys, wait up! Whoa. Cool. Saved your life! Oh, you guys made me eat! <laughs> What's that? I know what that is. Oh, oh, Sandy Plankin saw one. He called, he said it was called a, a butt. Oh, wow, that's a pretty big butt. Oh, look at me. I'm gonna go touch the butt. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> oh, yeah? Let's see you get closer. Okay. Beat that. Come on, Nemo, how far can you go? Oh, um, my dad says it's not safe. Nemo, no! Dad? Oh, you're about to swim into open water. No, I wasn't it's gonna go It's just a good go thing I was here. Dad, if I hadn't no, shown up, sorry, I don't know. he wasn't gonna go. Yeah, he was too afraid. No, I wasn't. This does not concern you, kids. And you're lucky I don't tell your parents you were out there. You know you can't swim well. I can swim fine, Dad, okay? No, it's not okay. You shouldn't be anywhere near here. Okay, I was right. You know what? We'll start school in a year or two. No, Dad! Just because you're scared of the ocean... Clearly you're not ready and you're not coming back until you are. You think you can do these things, but you just can't, Nemo! I hate you. There's nothing to see. Gather uh, over there. Excuse me, is there anything I can do? I am a scientist, sir. Uh, is there any problem? You know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt things. He, he isn't a good swimmer, and I just think it's a little too soon for him to be out here unsupervised. Well, I can assure you he's quite safe with me. Look, I'm sure he is. But you have a large class, and he can get lost, you know, from sight if you're not looking. No, I'm not saying you're not looking. You're oh, my gosh! Nemo's swimming out the sea! Well, good evening. My name is Anna Eckley, and I am on staff here at Hope as a chaplain, as well as the Hope Sports Coordinator, and I am so excited to be here tonight, mainly because I get to use my favorite movie as a sermon clip. All week I was like, guess what movie I'm using for my sermon clip this weekend? As a 20-something-year-old woman, my favorite movie of all time is Finding Nemo. And if you haven't seen it, I do believe it's family friendly, so I would encourage you to go watch it. It's so good. And I'm so excited because this clip, I think, just perfectly demonstrates what we're going to kind of get into tonight. And tonight, I might push some buttons. I might get under some skin. Uh, the topic might become a little bit uncomfortable for some of us. So I want you to remember that I'm actually a nice person in my favorite movie is Finding Nemo after I've been getting under your skin a little bit. Okay? But for tonight, our text starts with a question from James. And it says, what is causing the quarrels and the fights among you? And tonight, we're going to ask ourselves that question. What is causing the quarrels and the fights among us? And so the scene that we just saw in the clip was one of the most important scenes in the whole movie because we see this argument between a father and a son, an argument based on a misunderstanding, an argument based on reaction instead of a moment of reflection, an argument because the father just wants the best for his son, but his son just wants a little bit of room to breathe and to live. So when Nemo touches the butt, Nemo swims out to the sea, this argument has so much adrenaline, so much heat, that Nemo decides to go off the drop off, swim out to sea, and touch the boat. And when Nemo touches the boat, touches the butt, disaster happens. Like usually does when you touch someone's booty that you're not supposed to. There is a diver that shows up in the water. He captures Nemo. He takes him in his boat all the way to Sydney, Australia, which is far away from the drop-off where Nemo left his dad, Marlon, and his classmates. I can't imagine a life without this movie, but if you haven't seen it, the rest of the movie is pretty much Marlon's journey, as well as a new friend that he finds, Dory, it's his journey to go find Nemo and to bring Nemo back home. So James asks, what caused the quarrel and the fight between Marlon and Nemo? Well, first, misunderstanding. Marlon thought that Nemo was going to go and put himself in danger. 
even though we, as viewers, know that Nemo wasn't actually going to do that. This argument happened because Marlin had fears from his past. He had lost his wife and his unborn fishy children. So he had fears from his history that were controlling his and Nemo's life. And he let those fears get in between him and his son. And this quarrel happened because there were no questions being asked, just assumptions were made. Marlon forgot that Nemo is his son and he raised him to be a pretty smart fish. And all of a sudden, he forgets this and he gets so mad at Nemo. So when we look at the reasons of this fight, this, of this fictional movie, misunderstanding, fear, control, assumptions being made, all of a sudden it starts to feel a little bit more relatable. Have you ever been in an argument amongst your friends, your coworkers, your family members because of a misunderstanding? Or because you wanted the best for someone, but maybe they didn't see it that way? If we look at our Christian community, are the quarrels and the disagreements happening because people aren't asking questions and instead just making assumptions that they know people's intents and motives behind what they say or what they do? How many quarrels do we see online that instead of just calling a person, picking up the phone and saying, hey, what did you mean about that post and your wording? Instead, we see comments like, this is wrong, you're wrong, you're a terrible person, don't do this, don't do that, shame on you. We're surrounded by disagreements, but why? James says it's not because of the people around us even though it may feel easier to point our fingers or put blame on someone else, but James says it's because of ourself. It's because we have desires that guide us to want more, to have more control. We have desires to want more and more and more and take and take and take until we can't get any more. We have these desires as an unhealthy human nature of sitting and spewing and what the world says instead of what God says. So last spring, I had the opportunity to teach an emotionally healthy relationships class. And it was about 20 something young adults. We had a great time. And it's not, the irony is not lost on me that a newlywed was teaching an emotionally healthy relationships class. My husband and I had gotten married earlier in the year in January. This class started in April, and you know the saying, you know, you get what you pay for. Well, Hope's classes here are free. So we had a great time. It really was a great class. We learned so much. We talked about what it looks like to have emotionally healthy relationships. Our friendships, our working relationships, intimate relationships, I learned right alongside of them as we had conversations, uh, both surface level and deeper, as we talked about listening. What does it mean? What does it look like to be a good listener? As we talked about making assumptions in our relationships or setting expectations in our relationships. And of course, we talked about arguing or fighting because arguing, disagreeing, Having fights is a part of our life, and it's a part of being in a relationship. If you are only in relationships with people who agree with you 100% of the time, then I would challenge you to find new people to hang out with so that you can be challenged by them. But so we talked about these things, and healthy fighting was one of the last topics we talked about. I saved it all the way for the end because I didn't quite know what I was doing as a newlywed. I was, too, I was kind of scared to give advice, but I learned right alongside of with them. And you might be thinking, well, what did you actually teach them? 
Because doesn't Jesus say in Matthew 5, 9 that we are called to be peacemakers when he says blessed are the peacemakers? Well, yes, Jesus does say that. And I still taught them that it's okay to argue. Why? Because there are things in life that are worth arguing about. There are things in life that we should not be passive about just to create a false sense of peace. And so we learn from Jesus, who calls us to be peacemakers, the ultimate peacemaker, what healthy fighting, healthy arguing might look like. And for Jesus, being a peacemaker looks like having difficult conversations with his disciples or when he was rebuking people for their sins. With Jesus, being a peacemaker looks like overturning tables. Not violence, but overturning tables when things are not right. Peace looks like feeling emotions that aren't always happy and upbeat, but feeling emotions using our God-given gift to feel and listen to our emotions. So we talked about healthy fighting because there's unhealthy fighting, which is I think what James is referring to in our scripture for today, and then there's healthy fighting. And we are called to healthy fighting healthy quarrels, healthy disagreements, healthy conflicts in our life. James is saying that these disputes that you are having right now, they are petty, they are silly, and as a Christian body, whether you're arguing with someone within the body or with someone outside of the body, they're not helping anyone. So now we're at the point where we can say, okay, we've seen an example of an unhealthy argument from our friends Marlon and Nemo. I can think of an example in my life of an unhealthy argument. And I get that James is saying, this isn't good. But how do we have healthy arguments? What is healthy fighting? James says this is what healthy fighting is. Check your motives, submit to God, and have humility. So that's great, that's what James says, but what does all this look like? Well, now we can look to Jesus, the ultimate peacekeeper, of how he had healthy fighting and healthy arguments in his life. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look to Jesus and learn from Jesus. So first, James says, check your motives. When James asks this first question in verse 1, what is causing these arguments amongst you? It may be easy to say, well, did you hear what that person said? Did you see what that person was wearing? Did you see what that person posted online? Well, that's not looking at your motives. That's pointing a finger at another person. And you can't be responsible for another person. You can only be responsible for how you react. Therefore, in a healthy disagreement, the only person that you need to worry about is yourself. What did they say? They said something really hurtful. Well, how did you react? Did you have a motive of trying to get them back, of trying to hurt them back? Did you have a motive of just wanting to be heard and wanting them to know that you were right? Did you have a motive of wanting them to just know that they were wrong? In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus heal on the Sabbath. There was a man who was sick for 38 years, and Jesus sees him, and he desires to help him. And so back in the first century, the Sabbath looked a little bit different than what we might think of a Sabbath today. The Sabbath was truly a day of rest, of holy rest. Your physical body was resting. There was no yard work being done. There was no cleaning being done. It was just pure rest. So for Jesus to heal or to work on the Sabbath was a very big deal. 
And it went against what the world said was okay. And, and he began to become harassed by some of the Jewish leaders, by the Pharisees, for doing this. And so I just put myself in Jesus' shoes, and you can go ahead and try to put yourself in Jesus' shoes too. And I'm thinking that if someone is telling me that I'm wrong, even though I was doing something for another person, if they keep telling me I'm wrong for what I did, I want them to hear me that I'm actually right. So maybe the conversation starts to get a little bit heated. My voice starts to get raised. Maybe I start to say things that I don't really mean because I don't know who these people are. My motive was to make sure that they knew that they were wrong and that I was right. James says, check your motives. And then we look at Jesus' motive. And Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 30, Therefore, my judgment is just, because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Jesus says, you may question my motive, but my motive, even though you disagree with it, my motive is to honor God. And whether the Pharisees believed him, or they agreed with him, or they approved of this, Jesus could find peace in his heart because he knew that his motive was pure. And his intention was to honor God. So what are your motives? If your motive is to honor God, and you're doing it in a way that honors God, so with gentleness, kindness, love, then you should feel a sense of peace in your heart, even if the other person doesn't. If Marlon had the correct motive, instead of just needing to be in control, then that conversation would have felt a lot different. And maybe Nemo wouldn't have swam off the drop off. But thank goodness, Marlon, a cranky clownfish, is so relatable. So we need to check our motives. And next, James says, we need to submit ourselves to God. When we submit ourselves to God, that means that we're not actually trying to play God anymore. When we submit ourselves to God, that means that we understand it's not our job to declare ultimate justice in another person's life. And please don't hear me say that there aren't things we're standing up for or speaking up for, because there are things that we need to stand up for, while also checking our motivation and also checking to make sure that we aren't trying to play God and that there is ultimate justice, which is greater than anything we can imagine. And we can trust that God has it under control. It's not that we can't stand up for or speak against what is going on in the Middle East. Innocent people, men, women, children are brutally dying and suffering. We should act where we can. We should speak where we can. And also know that there are people that God has equipped with gifts, with knowledge, and with talents to be involved in this situation, to help defuse this situation. We can trust that God has equipped these people for such a time as this. And even though it may not happen the way we think it should happen, or it may not happen when we think it should happen, God isn't absent from this, and it's not our job to play God. Where I see people trying to play God the most is honestly behind this thing that we all have in our pockets, that we carry around with us all the time. These glass screens Six inches or so, I don't know how big they are now, six inches, they make us think that we have a lot of power. I know that phones can be great. I know that they can be good. I know that there is a good purpose behind them. But can we also sit back and realize that there has been a lot of destruction with phones? The destruction happens when we don't actually have to look at someone face to face when we are telling them that they are a terrible person. We don't have to see how our words might hurt them, might shatter them, maybe cuts them to their core. When we play God, 
with our phones, we declare that we know someone else's life better than God does. Or we try to play God when we see people saying that what's going on in the world is a sign that Jesus Christ is going to come back soon. We're not God, so we don't know that. And our phones don't tell us that. But when we submit ourselves to God, that means that we see people the way that God sees them, which is as his children, loved, cherished, not perfect, but will be made perfect one day in his image, his children. When we submit ourselves to God, that means we aren't calling 18 to 23-year-old men on a football field failures because they accidentally raised their arm a little bit too high at the end of a football game. Because we remember that before they're a football player, before they're a specific position, before they are on a specific team, they are a child of God. They are loved and they are cherished. When we submit ourselves to God, that means we don't call referees the worst people in the world because they're not the worst people in the world. Even if they make a very, very, very imperfect call, one day they are going to be made perfect in God's image. So we're a big Hawkeye family. I would say I'm a regular fan, but my husband, he's not a super fan. He's like a super, super, super fan. So together, that makes us a big Hawkeye family. And so yesterday, he was at the game. He doesn't miss many games, super fan. And I was at home watching the game. And after a pretty tough play, he texted me. He says, I'm done. And I get the frustration. It was a tough play to watch. So I responded with, to be fair, I probably would have dropped the ball too. To be fair, I probably would have just given them the ball if I had 250 pound men running at me. It wasn't the answer he was looking for. But we balance each other out. And what I'm trying to say is we don't have to play God and decide everything that is right or everything that is wrong in this world. Sometimes we just have to sit back and we have to say, God, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. This hurts. But I trust that you have this. Nothing is too big or too great for God. There is nothing that can't be undone or redeemed one day by God. And when we try to play God, we forget how big God actually is. But Jesus never forgot how big God the Father was. And Jesus never forgot how big his mission here on earth was. He submitted himself the moment that God sent his one and only son to earth to die for our sins. Which leads us to our third point. We have check your motives, Submit to God. And our third point is have humility. James is saying, church, where is your humility? When we don't act with humility, we tend to buff ourselves up. This is me buffing myself up. We tend to buff ourselves up and we look at other people and we say, I could do that better. Or at least I didn't do X, Y, and Z in my life. The church James was writing his letter to which is believed to have been the Jewish church scattered everyone, so I'm everywhere, so I think that's everyone. He was saying these quarrels amongst you are happening because where is your humility? Your motives are wrong, they're out of whack. You're trying to play God, you've forgotten your humility. Sometimes when people say submit to God, we think of the word like submit, as being passive, as being weak. And this is why using the word humility is so important. Because when you think of a, the most humble person in your life, would you describe them as weak? 
When I think of the most humble people in my life, I would also describe them as the most confident people because they are so confident in who they are that they don't have to be the loudest in the room. And they don't have to have all eyes on them. They don't need to have all the attention because they know, humble people know exactly who they are. So when James says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, humble yourself before God, James is saying, know who you are before God. Don't try to act like God, but know who you are, which is kind of the opposite of what our motives might say. Have confidence in who you are because God knows exactly who you are. And God would send his son again and again and again because you are his child and he loves you. When Jesus was facing his execution, he knew it was coming. He knew he was going to experience a brutal sinner's death. And in this moment, he could have said, no, I've been perfect. I am better than all of these other people. I am not doing this. But instead he cries out to God. He says, Father, take this cup from me. Father, this is not what I actually want. Father, does it have to be this way? But Jesus submits himself to God. And although he could have said, no, I'm perfect, he also looks around at us. And he says, God, if it is your will, he has confidence in who he is as the son of God. And he sees God's other children and says, this is for you. We don't really understand what humility looks like until we realize that the Son of God, God himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, came to earth to experience the brokenness that we experience every day and still say, I will pay the price of the ultimate sacrifice for you, I will overcome sin for you, and I will overcome death for you. That is humility. For some reason, with this truth, with this life-changing truth, we still get caught up in our quarrels. And this is important to James, because it not only affects us in our personal relationships, but it also affects the entire Christian community, and it affects the people who are looking in from the outside. The people who are looking in and saying, I don't want anything to do with that. So last time when I spoke in June at a Sunday 5 p.m. service, I shared that my husband and I had experienced a loss in our life. We experienced a miscarriage. Tonight, I'm excited to share that we are actually expecting a little baby boy, Eckley, to be welcomed into the world this spring. Yeah, that's super exciting. Thank you. And so as an expecting mother, I'm actually seeing a new side of motherhood that I've never seen before. And I kind of wish I didn't see. And it has made me reflect on maybe this is what people see when they're looking into the Christian church. So I don't have much experience with kids. I have a niece and a nephew and a new niece, Ezekiel Promise and Anaya, and I have no idea what to do with them half the time. And it's not just them, it's kind of like all kids, but they all flail their arms, and they all have snotty noses, and I try to give them a hug, and then they wanna be picked up, and then I pick them up, and my arm gets tired, so I wanna put them down, and then I put them down, and they start crying, and my good intention of giving them a hug in the first place just completely backfires. I don't have any idea what to do with kids. So as an expecting mother, without much experience, I've been doing a lot of research. I am asking my best friend, Google, a lot of questions. And because I've been asking Google so many questions, my social media algorithms have kind of started to change. So instead of once seeing home decor inspiration, now I am seeing 
mom inspiration. And I've been shocked because I see something that looks great. I see the sweetest moment of a mother holding her baby and I think it's beautiful. I think, wow, I can't wait for that. This is just exactly what I think God has planned for us. And then all of a sudden this beautiful image that I saw and I was so inspired by actually turns out to be something else because I look at the comments. And the image I was so inspired by has comments of people saying, you should not be holding your baby that way. You are trying to harm your baby. How dare you think that you are fit to be a mother? Don't you know this? Don't you know that? Shame on you. Something that looks great, something that sounds great, something that I've been dreaming about my whole life, motherhood, all of a sudden does not sound as lovely as I thought. Because instead of being, motherhood being this thing where moms are encouraging one another, saying, you've got this, you are doing great, good job. It's a place where every thought, every move, anything you try to do, you are going to be scrutinized. And people will say, how dare you? You are a terrible mother, therefore, you're a terrible person. And because of these comments, I've started to find myself in a state of fear and anxiety, so much so that I've removed social media completely off my phone. Because motherhood is this thing that's supposed to be beautiful, one of the greatest joys in the world, I believe. But it's coming off as something where every move you make is going to be scrutinized, and you're wrong. So as I've been reflecting on this, I realized that this is kind of the same thing that people outside of Christianity, outside of faith, may see when they're looking in. People who are curious, people who have heard that faith in a relationship with Jesus is far better than anything that this world can have to offer. People who hear about hope, peace, and love, they want this. So they start to do some research. They start to look around. Before they know it, this thing that was promised to be so great to them actually looks terrible. And they say, looking in, this is actually not something where I want to be a part of. And because of our skewed motives, because we are trying to play God, because we do not act with humility, the church has become this place known to be hypocritical and has been characterized by bitter controversies and divided. James warns us of these quarrels because it's not how we're supposed to live, but also because the effect it has on the people looking in is detrimental. In reality, wouldn't you want, wouldn't we think that we are all on the same page? Don't we all want people to know Jesus outside of the church? Don't we want them to know that there's so much more to life, that they are a child of God, that they are loved, and that they are cherished? Where instead, all they think is that we just can't get it together because we're fighting so much. Don't you think that all those mothers actually want what's best for that baby to be loved, to be warm, to be held, to be happy, to experience life? Instead, they get caught up in wanting to be right, wanting to be heard, and wanting to hurt other people. We live in a time period that's kind of unique. People no longer follow their faith People's faith follow wherever they found their belonging. So 30 or 40 years ago, people would go to church because they had a faith, they would go to church, and then at church, they would find their family. Whereas today, people first find where they belong, and then their faith will follow. 
So if people on the outside are looking in and they see Christians who are fighting, bickering, and being mean, they will say, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to belong there. Instead of looking in and seeing a place where their brokenness is welcome, instead of looking in and seeing a place where they are loved, where they are seen, where they are heard, where they are embraced, where they are cherished. Don't we want them to see? Don't we want them to hear that Jesus Christ died for them? And that faith can offer them so much more. We're gonna wrap up with a clip from Finding Nemo. It is a spoiler. Nemo and Marlin do get reunited in the end after a really long journey. So we're gonna wrap up here and I hope that you realize that there's a bigger picture than what we start to get angry with each other about. There's a bigger picture going on here and sometimes we just get lost in those little details. So take a look. Where's Nemo? There! Oh no. Nemo! <laughs> Nemo? Nemo? It's okay. Daddy's here. Daddy's got you. James wants us to know that this life of bickering, of arguing with one another, this isn't it. Because we all want the same thing. We all want people to know that they are loved by Jesus and that they are cherished and that they are children of God. And unless we check our motivations, unless we submit to God, unless we start to have humility, we're going to keep losing sight of that. And when we lose sight of it, it not only affects us and our relationships, it affects the whole body of Christ. It affects everyone else looking in, looking for a place where they belong, a place where they can call home. Quarrels and arguments are going to happen. They are a part of life. They are a part of our relationships. Healthy arguments are when you check your motives, you submit to God, and you act with humility. When you stand up for what is right, but don't lose sight of the big picture. Don't forget that God has got this. Whatever this is for you, whatever this may be, please never forget that the person to your right the person to your left, the kiddos on the football field, the person behind that screen, they are loved by God. They are a child of God. Don't miss the big picture. You are a child of God. You are loved by God. God's grace is for them, and God's grace is for you.